Hello everyone and welcome to another night. week yeah. of Saturn Stud Podcast. Yeah, the primetime edition because this shit ain't even going to get out till like 10 or 11. <laughs> the witching hours. If that. The pregame hours more like. Yeah, because turn up for winter Saturn weather. Stud's podcast. Yeah, fucking winter ass spring day we had today. Yeah, sunny in the morning right now. But right now, it's just like... There's like two inches of snow on the ground. It's pretty goddamn ridiculous. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, there's some stuff to talk about. Uh, not the thing we promised we'd talk about. Yeah, I... That's on me. Kurt's been diligent about his daredeviling. Um, yeah, I still haven't finished the last two episodes, though, so I can't absolve myself of all blame. But we will... Mm-hmm. No promises, but we will try to get that next week. Um, again, no promises. We'll see how these things shake out. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll do our best. Uh, look, we're looking like next week's going to be pretty light schedule. So we should be able to uh, get get that done, hopefully, forever and for always. Yeah, we got a window there. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Capcom Pro Tour news. Uh, first major, mm-hmm. much like... their second major, much like the first. Uh Infiltration <laughs> to Kidogo 1 2 again. Um, pretty much like five of the same people in the top eight were there. Mm-hmm. So, like. The meta hasn't been solved yet. No, well, it's still early in the game. You know, we didn't see like. defined meta happen for four until like almost the end of 2010. Almost, mm-hmm. almost a year after the game came out. And especially, it's not. It's still up for grabs, especially now that Alex just came out. Yeah, Alex just came out. He plays a lot like he did in Third Strike, which makes me a happy, happy man. Um, we'll see how he, how tournament viable he is. Uh, he's got tools to be good. He's still a stun and damage monster, but yep. we'll and see if uh, he can, he can uh, compete with the Nashes of the world. Uh, yeah. My own experience with the Ryu matchup has been a bit rough. <laughs> Um, yeah, he plays a little bit differently, does he, from Third Strike? Yeah, like the, I'm still getting used to the fact that there aren't just static parries that I can use. Because <laughs> like I just I was playing early in the morning and I just kind of lapsed into muscle memory. So like I got I hit a can with a power bomb and just Third Strike mode engaged and I dashed up, waiting to parry his wake up uppercut. And then when I hit forward, I instantly realized that I fucked up. <laughs> And I hate all that damage and lost the round in the game. So, that was fun. In other news, censorship in gaming. Uh, I'm sure everyone listening uh, probably has heard, at least in passing, the term butt gate. If not, I'll break it down for you. <laughs> the um, guy who till like 30 seconds ago didn't know what it was. Yeah, because you broke it down for me. Because um, I saw it, I didn't realize it had a name. It got okay. a name pretty quick. Um... Tracer from Overwatch had a pose with butt, and they took it out because the person was like, I don't like it. Yep, person who probably wouldn't have bought or played the game to begin with, but Blizzard's like, PR must maintain good PR, and they took it out. Um, Actually, this is kind of, uh, there's been a war on butts in video games lately. Really? Because Street Fighter V even... Uh, we'll tie it back into here, okay? Because it was all over our kappa because everyone in our kappa is super perverted. Um, <laughs> so, uh, in the one of the beta releases, uh, when Armika went to do her critical art, she'd slap her ass, and they took that out. They changed the camera angle on that, and then when Cammy's entrance pose like came up from like underneath her, and it was like a bit of a crotch shot, and they took that out mm-hmm. because. People who would never touch the game anyway were like, I don't like it. Take it out. It makes me feel insecure. Because that's obviously our, all, pro- all of our problem and not theirs. Right. Yeah, uh, yeah there's been too much censorship in video games recently, and it's kind of kind of a sad state of affairs. I don't know. I just... I'm, I'm cool with it. Just like... Both... It's just so blown out of proportion in my eyes right now i see the people arguing for it and i'm like 
okay, you're arguing for censorship in gaming. I see the people arguing against it, and I'm like, it's such a small change that, like, bringing up and having to, like, champion it is kind of weird. But, you know, you give a little bit. You give an inch and they take a mile, you know? Like, if you keep appeasing them, like... Churchill, not Churchill, the guy who came before Churchill, Chamberlain, appeased Hitler. Mm -hmm. Eventually, Germany owns half of Europe, and World War II starts. I really don't think the slippery slope applies here. I don't know. It's like, they didn't even, they're just going to give him, give her another pose. That's all. Well, it's, it's, it's not necessarily, like, that the butt is so important. Uh, it's the fact that Something so small, n people felt the need to to change it and make a big stink about it. Yeah, that's I what I think. I'm... It's the people. It's the people who push for censorship who made the bigger stink about it, and then right. the people who are like, "What the fuck do you care?" Like, it just on principle was like, "No, this is bullshit. We shouldn't have to have censorship in in this medium." And I, I'm not saying that like it's going to lead to World War Three. Right. I'm saying that, like, it sets a, a somewhat dangerous precedent. And this isn't the first thing that's, you know, kind of happened to set this precedent. But, like, the more you give and, like, the more, like, there's been a ton of stuff. Like, there was something in an Obsidian game, like some item with, that mm -hmm. a fan uh, won a contest to have put in the game. And they were able to write the item description and someone took offense to the story in it and they... They had to remove it from the game and then, like, put a slight jab at the whole censorship and the thing. But it's it's just something that, like, I don't feel good about it happening. Like, okay. I feel like it's... I don't want to say a slippery slope, but, you know, it's a dangerous precedent, okay. I think. Because, you know, where does it end? Yeah, I do agree with you that the fact... Like, that one person could bring this much, like, attention and cause this much of a, just, like, dis uh, discussion. Eh, I don't know about that. Um, it's a lot of yelling, not a whole lot of discussing cause that, going yeah, on. Cause that much divisiveness. Just, you know, because it was, it was one person, right? Yeah, I think so. And... That that's what kind of scares me, you know. Maybe yeah, I agree. Not the censorship itself, but the fact that it can be so minority controlled. Yeah, it's like not even like a vocal minority. It's like one person said it, and then of course you know like with how the internet goes, like you know that sounds some sort of alarm, and like everyone from both sides come out. All the keyboard warriors from both sides come out to do battle. <laughs> And the, and the crucible that is Twitter. <laughs> Keyboard cage dungeon fighters. What was that? Who? Y'all remember that one? That sounds um, amazing. It was some guy. I forget his name, but he was like calling out all the people like arguing against him, and he called him like keyboard cage basement fighters <laughs> or some shit like that. I'm sure if, if we looked it up... I'm very familiar with the term keyboard warrior that has a lot of traction mm -hmm. in a lot of circles. Um, <laughs> keyboard cage dungeon master warrior fighters mark II. Um, um, Overwatch is a 3D game. <laughs> okay, okay. Keeping up in historically bad transitions. Uh, mm -hmm. Overwatch is a 3D game. Uh, a type of game that made a rough transition to 3D was the platformer. So let's yeah. talk about bad and good platformers. 3D platformers. <laughs> well, how about we start from the shining examples and work our way down? Or do you want to like start historically? I mean, they're kind of tied together. Yeah. Cuz I think Super Mario 64 was the it was the bar that they um, ended up setting. I would argue Crash Bandicoot was the first good yeah. 3D okay. platformer. Yeah, I I will agree with you there. Because it came out like a year before Mario 64. Mm -hmm. um, I, f I feel like we talked about Mario 64, oh, the one we did our fifth generation episode, that's right. Right. I was like, this all seems so familiar. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it hits on a lot of things. Yeah, you know? I mean, like, platformers really 
ran the gaming market um, from 1985 to 1995. Like, yeah. they had a good 10-year run of dominance. So where... the Xbox started, like, making moves. Well, like, no, I'm like, that's just NES to end of Genesis Super Nintendo era. Like, mm-hmm. you think about it, because, you know, Mario was the killer app for the NES 2D platformer. Right. Sonic the Hedgehog, killer app for the Genesis and kind of Master System uh, 2D platformer. Mm-hmm. Very different 2D platformers, you know, each unique style. But, like, everyone tried to cash in on the platformer game because they're like, this is making money hand over fist. So you got a lot of platformers in general, some good, some bad, mostly depending upon, like, how good the controls were. Like, DuckTales, good platformer. Um, Fucking shit. So you think you want a name for, like, a, bla- a bad platformer? Yeah, like, around um, the same era. I yeah, I don't totally even think totally blanked on that. Uh, Fucking... Um, the Noid. Yo the Noid. Noid. Okay, yeah. Yep. Yo Noid. Bad platformer. Of course, that had some other random ass shit from in it. That was kind of yeah. like not platformer. I think like Plock, but I'm like, no, that was pretty good. If you if you told me today I was going to make a Yo Noid reference, I would have slapped the taste right out of your mouth and been like, yeah. get the fuck out of my room. Why my are you room, here, stranger? While I'm wearing my shorts in this sunny <laughs> weather. Because it's April, right? Yeah. That's going to stay didn't do that it's yeah it's barely april mm-hmm. um it's and it's worth noting like i i mentioned the xbox because like the playstation one started to change this but i feel like it wasn't until which uh, the sixth generation right xbox ps2 dreamcast yeah yeah um where they started really branching out into you can make other genres of action-y sort of games. Yeah, like, I, in the early days, it was pretty much exclusively either a platformer, a fighting game, or an RPG. And there was very little in between. Spaceship shooters, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. But yeah, there was very little in between those those basic genres. Now, I, I know I'm overgeneralizing, and mm-hmm. people will probably be able to make a list uh, from here to Nantucket of other genres of game present during that time. But for the most part, the ones most people remember can be break, broken down into those categories. Not the same categories that you can break any game into, which right. would be rhythm action, uh, puzzle, and... Spreadsheet. Spreadsheet. Yes. That's another time, though. That's a callback. <laughs> Did we talk about that before? Yeah. Uh, it was in one of the Sonic Adventure Oh, episodes, yes. Okay, yep, yep, yep. Uh, which you should watch, because some of them Dude. are funny. Cause a couple of them. <laughs> Just, just in there somewhere. <laughs> Not all of them. Yeah, some, you, have to, you have to wade through some shit when we were just, like, super tired at 2 a.m. They are like, why are we playing Sonic Adventure 2 at 2 a.m.? Did you just hear nothing but... Yeah. <laughs> Poor Peter. <laughs> I'm just, like, in a glaze trying to slog through these levels, and Peter's trying his best to keep the show entertaining and watchable. Started listing cereals. <laughs> or s- snacks. <laughs> Wait, no, that was, uh, we haven't aired it yet, but fucking, was it cereals or candy that you, like, you were, like, wasting so much time in this one Super Mario World <laughs> level? I don't even Star know. Wars trying to get to the secret entrance, and, like, the clock's ticking down, you got, like, 98 seconds, and you're, like, hitting every possible block, naming, like, fucking cereals or candy bars or some shit like that <laughs> as you hit each one, and I'm like, it's... I don't even know that we're talking about real things anymore. <laughs> oh, yeah, you break it breaks down. I broke down. <sighs> yeah, that was a that's a, another Super Mario World. That's a good two D platformer. Mm-hmm. But uh, when they made the jump to three D, I mean, I think like the PS One was the the first one to really make the jump with a three D platformer. I got a Saturn example that's loose but we'll throw it in there mm-hmm. when the time comes appropriate. Um, but yeah, Crash Bandicoot was, I guess, the, I wouldn't say the de facto mascot for Sony in those days, yeah. but definitely definitely the one carrying the flag for them, mm-hmm. so to speak. I had a friend who was a PS PlayStation kid, and he just, that was like his thing. He loved those games. They were good so games. They were yeah. well put together. Um, 
since they were kind of the first ones to do it, no one really had established any, like, rules for what a 3D platformer should or shouldn't be. Mm -hmm. So So, it's pretty linear, right? Yeah, like, some of the uh, levels were pretty linear, and then there were, like... Like, I don't know if it was the majority of the game was, like, the -the over-the-shoulder perspective, but, like, at least a good portion of it was the -the over-the-shoulder perspective, which, you know, it worked for the level design, of course, Mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, they built the game around it. Right. But uh, maybe not, like, the best, like, in terms of having good depth perception of how how far you gotta jump and all that. So, like, it wasn't a flawless transition from 2D to 3D, but I thought it was a pretty good first effort. Uh, The first 3D platformer to come out of Sega's camp that I can think of, uh, well, I guess, technically, it'd be Sonic 3D Blast on the Genesis. But that was a 2D with height. Yeah, it was a selective Z-axis. It's kind of like Link to the Past sort of Mm -hmm. uh, 3D, quasi-3D. Yeah, that's when we get to good games that transitioned. I won't... Legend of Zelda transitioned amazingly. I, I no okay, I think they transitioned better than a lot of games. It yes okay I'll give it that but not amazing. amazingly no. might be stretching it a bit. Yeah I threw that one out there. We'll uh, we'll revisit that even though it's not really a, a platformer but we'll we'll get there when we get there. Yeah. Um but uh technically it was Sonic 3D Blast but Nights into Dreams I would guess yep. would be the first foray into 3D platformer, and that was fucking completely different yeah. than anything Crash like, Bandicoot related. Yeah, Genesis, like the Saturn, was like, what is this with 3D platformer? We could fly now. No, we're just going to fucking explore the 3D space. Yeah, so they had Panzer Dragoon and Knights, and those are the yeah. big ones. Knights, I would say, is more of a platformer, and uh, like Panzer Dragoon was... Star Fox 64, two years before Star Fox 64 was a thing. Um, yeah. But, yeah, but Knights was... I mean, I guess platformers kind of loosely uh, put it in a box there, but mm-hmm. uh, yeah, it was... It was... There were there was platforming tasks, sort yep. of, and then it was in 3D. So I guess it ticks the mm-hmm. important boxes to qualify. Yeah, it was about getting through the level. Yeah. It wasn't about, like, Panzer Dragoon, you had to shoot stuff. But with Knights, you had to still had to get through the level. It just yeah, that yeah, the like, platforming do... was everywhere, and you could go everywhere. Yeah. And you could, like, avoid obstacles and stuff, and you could do tricks of some sort. Not like a horror does tricks, but, you know... <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, people might look at Knights and think it's a completely different game. (laughs) I mean, dressed fairly provocatively. Also dressed like a fucking alien. I I would say more like courtroom gesture. Yeah. Than alien, but sure. Sure. (laughs) Alien. We'll go with that. Did you ever... I played the remake. Did you play the remake? Um... Was that on, like, one of the Sonic's? Oh, I did not play the Wii Wii make, no. It was okay. I liked it. They made the... You know, if it was on Wii U, and the graphics were even better, it would have been nice. But it's good to see Knights when it wasn't, like, polygonal. The... Yeah, I was... But the graphics jump, to be fair, the graphics jump from the Saturn to the Wii was not, like, the game changer. No. People did not buy the Wii for its graphics. No, they bought it for its gimmicky motion controls, so they were super excited that the Wii moved so much hardware, but, like, no software, because yeah. the, like, best-selling game on the Wii was Wii Bowling. was Wii Sports, which was a glorified tech demo. Yep. But, that oh my really God. wasn't... Yeah, but it worked well for them. Uh, back to the topic at yeah. hand. <laughs> Wii Bowling is not a platformer. No, no. Unless there's some secret bonus level that I haven't unlocked. You just run yet. around the bowling alley whacking people in the face with a bowling ball? I would play that game. <laughs> play someone the hell mod, out of that game. Someone mod it. Do a mod. Yeah. Mod the Wii. Jeez. <laughs> what a Herculean task. Well, I mean, there was soft mod for the Wii. Like, my Wii is soft modded, so I haven't, like, paid for a Wii game in, like, 16 years. Nice. <laughs> um, anyway. Platformers. 3D platformers. Yeah. Nights into Dream. Um, I'm just thinking of, like, other games that, like, 
needed their own special controller. Like, you could play Knights with the standard Saturn pad, but they came out with the 3D controller, which had an analog stick. And I think that predated the analog versions of the DualShock 1. Mm -hmm. So, first analog stick goes to Sony. Hey, yo. Win. <laughs> yep. And the analog stick is a very important feature. You know, 3D gaming wouldn't do wouldn't be anything without it because yeah. As a camera feature, it's you know, it when you think about an analog stick, like if you hold one in front of your hand, it mimics a uh, a hemisphere. And, you know, ideally that means you should be able to rotate your camera or your character around that hemisphere. Yeah. And I think that's one of the reasons why when the N64 launched, uh, their controller had an analog stick, and I think that's one of the reasons why um, Mario 64 controlled as well as it did, is because yeah. it had an analog stick. Uh, Crash was... Uh, it had an interesting handicap in that it was a 3D platformer control of a D-pad. Ooh. Yeah, and that's kind of rough. Um, I remember when I made the jump from... Uh, the Genesis to the original Xbox. Uh, one of the first games I had was a a uh, movie tie-in game from a topic <laughs> for this week that we dropped. Yeah, um, he had plenty of fodder for movie tie-in games. I did not. I wouldn't say plenty with. of fodder. I was just hoping I'd have enough, and then you'd be able to play off of it, which yeah. is usually how these things boil down. Mm -hmm. But not. I we just looked at it and we were like. I just don't think Peter's there. like I don't think I have anything for any of these and I'm like well shit um <laughs> change of plans <laughs> cause he mentioned action adventures and we just kinda got the 3D platformers mm -hmm. with her normal weird trainers of thought but uh speaking of trainers of thought I completely lost my mind we were talking about Mario 64 you were 64, talking you right? played a movie tying game oh right, okay yeah. yeah so it was Spider-Man uh, oh yeah the, like the movie game of Spider-Man uh Treyarch that was a pretty... Yeah. Oh, Treyarch. Um, yeah. <laughs> that was a pretty unique control scheme. Uh, yeah, but, like, this, the story goes is that, like, I didn't know how to fucking work an analog stick. Oh. Like, it was this weird alien piece of technology to me. Mm -hmm. So, for a while, like, I played on the D-pad, and it was, like, so clunky to control, and I'm like, I just... Okay, I'm gonna learn how to use this other thing. And then that was my exposure to the analog stick and the wonders that allowed it to work. Mm, you need omnidirectional. I saw, I saw the analog Jesus. Mm -hmm. And the thing, they didn't even bring it, like, they took it from arcade stuff. They said, yeah. why don't we just use the arcade? You can go in all directions. It can better map 3D space. Yeah. It's like they took a trackball and then they made it more sensical. And able to use with a thumb. Mm -hmm. Able to usable? Yeah, able um, to use with a thumb. Able Mario, so Mario 64. Yeah. The, you know, this was when, like, Crash Bandicoot was the first, and, you know, you had some early ones, but this is where you saw a lot of the big tropes of 3D games, and a lot of, you know, when they threw Mario 64 into the gaming pool, it cast a big ripple. Yeah. Um... You know, Mario 64 kind of really pioneered the idea of the home world, like the... The hub world, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, it did so much creative with its platforming. It was able to go all around 3D space. Yeah, they really maximized the use of 3D. I think, I feel like, um, at least with the first Crash, I'm trying to think of, like, how Crash 2 and 3 worked and whether or not they had come out with the analog version of DualShock by then. Mm -hmm. um, but, like, at least with Crash, like, it was more or less your standard platformer. It just happened to have 3D graphics. Um, Mario 64 really felt like... I mean, Knights, I, I, let's not take anything away from Knights. That really explored yeah. the 3D space and made use of it being in three dimensions. But I feel like Mario 64 took the conventional platforming uh, level design and really uh, perfected it in terms of like having 3D space mm -hmm. and being able to explore the space. Yeah, and it was kind of the proto-design for what is now open world, really, because it yeah. allowed you to go where you wanted. And 
that sort of trope was copied relentlessly by much worse games. Yes. Think of how many like PS1 games you can envision in your mind where you have the hub world and there's like just the random level zones that don't connect to each other in any way. Yeah. You get there. I can I can see the low draw distance fog in my head as we speak. Yeah. Um we've talked about some of the better ones, but there were definitely some bad ones that came along with it, and I think you know, I'm gonna throw this title out there, but there's nothing we can say about it that hasn't already been said, and uh, it was Bubsy 3D. Yeah, ooh. There, that was all one. Did it, that one didn't even have a hub world, it just had level and level and level, and they weren't even chained together in any um, sensical way. Yeah, level would be a generous way to describe uh, the seemingly unfinished. Um, <laughs> Some debug areas shooters. that uh, were the core of yeah. the gameplay. Because, uh, Jesus Christ. Um, Don't make all your levels checkerboard uh, texture. Yeah, it looked like, untextured. It really looked unfinished. It controlled like hot ass and uh, just was not good. Mm-hmm. And there were a lot of other. Um, I don't know. Was Gex a 3D platformer? I think so. Like. If you had, if it was an animal mascot, it was probably a 3D platformer. I, I need to look that up because okay. part of me, like part of my head, thinks it was like a Donkey Kong Country sort of like 3D graphics on a 2D level. Yeah. Um. So you know, side note: tank controls, Resident Evil, not a 3D platformer, but still honorable mention for having an interesting control scheme. Um. And while he's looking that up, after Mario. You know, it had its hub world where you went, you were in the middle, and then you went to a level, and you did something, you came back, and you went to another level, and you came back. But then you started seeing these other games that said, all right, this feel, this is good, but it feels kind of disjointed. What if we were able to connect all the levels with a story? And they reached back and they realized, you know, yeah, there's a history a 3D of... Platform. Okay, and this actually, yeah, this actually kind of ties in with the point you're about to make here. Is Gex kind of did have a story? Like the first few Gex games weren't bad; they were just kind of marred by being on the 3DO, mm-hmm. which was a terrible, terrible yeah. system that was uber expensive. Shame on you, Panasonic. Panasonic. Yeah. Don't make a console. <laughs> um, but yes, so we had to connect the story, but but then they thought. Like, we can't really have one big super linear level. What if we connected it with, like, cutscenes? And that's when cutscenes kind of really came into their own as a, as, a sto- as a new video game storytelling trope. Yes, and uh, the uh, example of an early adopter of cutscenes, perhaps a little too overzealous, would be the first Metal Gear Solid, which was a PS1 game with a 15 minute cutscene. And let me repeat that again, because it's fairly important and I'm not sure you fully appreciated what I just said. PS1 game, 15 minute cutscene. That's, oh, just how much the, memory that did that eat up? I, probably like a quarter of a disc. That's probably why it was as many discs as it was. <laughs> the only other PS1 game I can think of that even comes close to that would be Final Fantasy VII. And I think the longest cutscene in that is like three or four minutes. Yeah. Well, oh. it's like a movie, and Mel Gear's like, let's just make movies in our games now. Yeah, because Hideo Kojima's like, I wanted to be a movie guy. And I don't know if his movie sucked or that just was a pipe dream to begin with, but somehow found the video games, and he's like, I'm going to make a movie, <laughs> but it's going to be slightly interactive. Slight- <laughs> Metal Gear Solid, slightly more interactive than your average movie. <laughs> Metal Gear Solid kind of parallels a lot of the changes that the 3D genre has made in the last few years because um, it started off, the big thing was platformers. And then it moved into what we would call action-adventure because they said, we have the story now, and we have kind of platforming, but is that all we have? Like, can we do something else? And then they started to tinker around with how to... You connect the leveling and the story and, and just, the elements yeah, of the game. Yeah, play with different gameplay mechanics within 3D. 
And I feel like that kind of... And then we developed... Gave, the gave rise world. to things. Yeah, like the open world. I wouldn't necessarily call Metal Gear open world. But, like, it gave rise to, like, different kind of 3D play styles. And then I guess it's just mm-hmm. going to branch out to fucking 3D gaming in general. Yeah. But, um, like, uh, around that same time, like, yep. I don't know if they were on the, the PC. I know they were on the PC. I don't know if they were on anything else. But things like uh, Thief the Dark Project and stuff like that kind of, mm-hmm. like, brought in this whole 3D stealth gaming genre. Oh, yep. And then also, like, on the PS, on the PlayStation and, and, and such, uh, you had Resident Evil come in and pioneer this whole survival horror genre mm-hmm. that was in 3D. and Which, that's an also important part about 3D games. You couldn't see everywhere. Yeah. You'd there walk into a hidden. room and you wouldn't have all the information available to you. Which allows things to scare you. Yep. That was pretty important. Um, there's also, you know, as open world was developing, this is a little later, um, but I would be remiss if we didn't mention it, Jet Set Radio Future. Like, that's a seamless game where all the areas connect to each other in an yeah. organic way. You have a hub world, but everything else goes into each other. Yeah, like everything's connected. Like, uh, fucking, like you're, you're the... the Gigi's, mm-hmm. yeah, the Gigi's base, the garage connects to like uh, Okinawa Hill and the sewers and uh, mm-hmm. God, what's the, the what's Wazaka the pla- Hill? What's the place where Rapid Ninety Nine is? That's oh shoot. Um, I I, I, I want to call it Tokyo because it's yeah, definitely Tokyo, based to- off no, Tokyo. Um. um that's a stumper. Shit. Okay, I'll, I'll look up okay. Jet Crying Radio yeah, levels while like, you stall. <laughs> okay, and Jet Set Radio 2 was a really interesting control scheme because you could grind, and th- they used that as basically magnet skates to let you get everywhere you wanted in Faster, the level. Yeah. yeah, and you could... That's kind of a lot of the... That's where kind of the pure platforming is now, is this sort of parkour-focused uh, setup. Yeah, Assassin's Creed and such kind of... Uh, push that okay. forward but uh getting back to uh our roots here i guess uh you wanted to talk about uh zelda so yeah. why don't you start making your points about mm-hmm. zelda while i prepare my rebuttals and look up okay these fucking... well in the same like, this is all happening at the same time people are developed they're making games 3d they're finding out all these ways to explore it was all these quite dimensions. a time to be alive oh my gosh what a day um and what a day to be a young man in America <laughs> <laughs> so I said I say Zelda transitioned well into 3D because it wasn't like other 2D games at the time it was top down it was one of the first top down games where you went around and was still an action game because you had stuff like Dragon Warrior puzzle game. yeah oh, okay puzzle game that's how we broke it down it was a puzzle game yep but you know, rhythm action a little bit too. But anyways, um, you know, other games would be like Dragon Warrior or Final Fantasy 1 where you walked around and you didn't do anything in real time. It was all turn-based. Yeah. And Zelda came around and, heck, you were top-down and you were exploring the 2D space in a different way and you were using... It was a novel presentation, which they, you know, they threw out in... Uh, Zelda 2 because they're like well if we went back to platform style yeah. and that didn't work out too well but I then, think I think Zelda 2 if it were called anything else yeah would be remembered very fondly but because it was a Zelda game that was not like the first Zelda game it is Tokyo Toe you were right okay or was it no that's a whole city Tokyo Toe is Street. the city no, Hikage Street is... Fuck, is it Hikage Street? So, Dogenzaga Hill, Shibuya Terminal... Kibogoaka Hill is the... Okay, yeah, that's the slums. Yeah, because there's... Dogenzaga Hill is the daytime, Kibogoaka Hill is the evening, and then Hikage Street is the nighttime. Are you sure it's Hikage Street? I feel like it. Let's look at this screenshot. Oh, that looks pretty daytime to me. Here. No, Hikage yeah. Street's with the giant dinosaur. That's with the T-Rex. Right. Um, hmm. Fucking interesting. Is is it skyscraper district? I feel like I would remember. Shibuya Toe is the bus terminal. Okay, 
rooftop sewers construction. Kogane. Um, where was I talking about? You were talking about Zelda. Zelda, yes. So, you know... It oh, was, it's 99th Street. It was natural. I, I felt it was... That makes sense, because it's Rapid 99 and all that. Oh, yeah. But, but I didn't think it would be Benton. that. It's in Benton Cho. Right. Okay. Um, but Zelda already had a way for you to move in two planar directions. So they only needed to add the height. And I think they did pretty well with that. Um, um, like, because their first foray into it was... Ocarina. Ocarina, right. And, you know, I can't speak for the Z-targeting and the camera controls. I'm not as big a fan of Ocarina as everything else else seems to be it was good foundation yeah I'm uh, not me Majora's Mask was a much better game and uh fuck you if you disagree it's the truth um it was much better paced cause like there'd be times in Ocarina where the plot would just disappear cause you had to do your fetch quest yeah all of Ocarina was a goddamn fetch quest. Now, I'm not saying that's all been eliminated in Majora's Mask, but Majora's Mask, it feels more concise because there's a time. There's a, mm-hmm. there's always the story. You never forget the story because there's a giant fucking-ass moon above you yep. the entire goddamn that's time. That's how you use your height. You put a thing up in the sky. Yeah, but, like, like as far as controls go, it translated well to 3DS. However, in terms of game design and level design and enemy design, maybe not so much. Right. Because the thing about Z-targeting is that it made everything, like, it made a disconnect. Like, you've all seen Ego Raptor's sequelitis video, I'm sure. And if you haven't, you're probably going to look it up now that I said that. Uh, but he makes some good points for Ego Raptor mm-hmm. in those videos. <laughs> um, there was a huge disconnect between level exploring and combat, largely because of Z-targeting and how enemies behaved in 3D space. Right. Like, he gave the example of bats. Bats used to be just a fucking throwaway enemy in all the other Legend of Zelda games. Swing a sword, kill a bat, get the heart. You know? It was simple, clean, boom, 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 boom. 3D Zelda comes out, and we gotta do the Z-targeting bullshit. So we walk in the room... You don't you don't see the bat right away because it's fucking a dark temple and the bat's fucking black mm-hmm. and it's just flying around in the background. You hear Random something, shit. but you don't see anything. And then you get hit by it and you're like, okay, there's a fucking bat in here. I gotta hold Z on my N64 controller and it's gonna target the bat. Okay, I've got the bat. You fucking fire your hook shot or you swing your sword and the bat dies. Okay, you're like that's not such a big deal, but you have to fucking first locate the bat <laughs> which is not always the easiest thing because yeah, you mean, have to the have joker yeah right yeah. locating the bat's pretty tough you have to fucking like because you can't just hit z and have it auto lock on the enemy you have to it has a... to be in your line of sight so you have to put the bat in your line of sight you have to hold z you have to wait for it to target and then you have to hit it with your fucking whatever weapon you're using it mm. it it took a one second button press and turned it into like a four to five second scavenger hunt. Right. And they've I, they've learned from that a lot. And you see that in later 3D Zelda titles. Yes. That they've, you know, they made the Z-targeting automatic. Hashtag just, Twilight Princess. Exactly. Like, and all the enemy design is reasonable so that you're not like, there are no super crazy jittery enemies like, I couldn't imagine... Is there even a whiz robe in any of the new 3D Zeldas? I'm sure there is. But could you imagine trying to fight a whiz robe? No. In, oh, yeah, no, there is one in um, Wind Waker. Oh. There is, yeah. like... So they happen sometimes. I haven't played but, the Zelda since Twilight Princess. <laughs> like, all the way through. Like, mm-hmm. I've I've tried Skyward Sword, and it was like, yep, not my cup of tea. Oh, you didn't like it? No. Okay, I, I kind of enjoyed it. I just got... I have this thing where I get through a long just not so even a long video game but I just boring get boring to me I could see that I like I got into a place and then I stopped my momentum and then I couldn't pick it back up again yeah I had that problem like it took me like like I played through Final Fantasy 7 right and it took me like 7 months to get like through the first 2 discs 
and then because I kept like walking away and coming back, and like there right. was no journal in that game, so I was like, okay, what was I doing? And I had to like try to piece together things, and I had missed things like getting Vincent, and uh, I missed a few like other things. Like it, it took me forever to get fucking Yuffie, and I don't even remember if I got. It. But the, the, to make the the long and short of it is like I had to start over and like mm-hmm. make a conscious effort to you know plow through the game in a reasonable amount of time and I would actually write down what I did last time before yeah. I would leave the play. Yeah, same thing. Like For me, my biggest experience with that was I played Chrono Cross, the incoherent sequel to Chrono Trigger. Chrono that Trigger, made such a beautiful game. Chrono, Chrono Cross, such a horrible abomination. Like The story makes no sense in that at all, but that wasn't the reason I dropped it. Like I dropped it because I had a fight, like some sort of boss... I didn't know how to beat, and I looked up walkthrough, and they all had moves that were different from their character type, right. and that's when I realized Chrono Cross doesn't have stab. You don't have stab bonuses. Right. And I was just like, well, I've been playing this game wrong the entire time, never coming back. <laughs> I'm out. Yeah. Ah, uh, dude. We should, yeah, we'll talk about RPGs in a future episode, because mm-hmm. I have a lot of ammo for that one. Yeah, um, but you were the foremost opinion on Al- Ad Alfred on Kotor. <laughs> Probably the most foremost opinion in the greater Mid Atlantic on Kotor. <laughs> Weird. Um, so we we're talking about Zelda, and that was that's its own thing, because like not a lot of other. Well, no, I can't say that because they start picking up on Zelda, and they put the Zelda games and then the connected 3D platforming games together. And that all sort of synthesized, and I think the next big platforming revolution was Assassin's Creed and Uncharted. Those were the two. Those are the two big things that stand out in my mind as this is what the current generation of 3D platforming is. I would I would be inclined to agree. Open world co- connected um, platforming sections that focus more on parkour. And momentum. And are all connected by a, a story. Mm-hmm. I was going to say a strong story, and then I remembered that Assassin's Creed 3 is a thing. Yeah. And I think you killed the Pope in one Assassin's Creed. It's a weird... Mm-hmm. Series gets weird. How many how many references can we throw in here? Oh, no. You know? Fucking... I, I stopped caring. Like, I played Assassin's Creed 1 and 2, and those are good games. I'm not going to sit here and shit talk them. I mean, some of the things are a little clunky and all that. Uh, and then Assassin's Creed came out, and I was like, whatever. It was Assassin's Creed 3, I don't care. And then Assassin's Creed 4 came out, and they're like, you can be a pirate. And I'm like, I went reverse Jerry Seinfeld. And I was like, I want to be a pirate! <laughs> and I went out, and I was a pirate. And I don't even remember fucking, I don't even think I beat the story of Assassin's Creed 4. I just had too much fun being a fucking yeah, pirate. because they made the good premise and like that's that's part of it now it's like the platforming alone is okay but the way the game is set up you can't you you can't win the day on ga- platforming alone you have yeah. to use the story now which you know you can argue is good or bad yeah. you know it depends story versus gameplay that's a whole another topic yeah. for another podcast because like if you think about the platforming in Assassin's Creed it's a city and all the platforming types are the same. Yeah. You know, that's not the big challenge. No, pretty but much you just... It's a strong element. Hold right game. trigger and you can do whatever. <laughs> Instead of go right, it's go right trigger. Yeah, just hold right trigger and we've, you we've can... We've come full circle, ladies you and gentlemen. You can scale any, any great height in a mere few bounds. Yep. Um, yeah. So, and that kind of leaves us where we're at today with uh, 3D platformers. There were some games that were fairly influential that we left out, like the first Sonic Adventure series. Yep. Uh, kind of like Sonic was did. the first one that grabbed hub world narrative story and like fast paced 3D platforming and like blended it all together. And you know it's up to you whether or not you think the result was good or not. I think it was. I yeah, mean, it's but it's a tough thing to get right because Sonic goes fast and 3D space, especially for people, because it's so analogous to people, yeah. is not a very intuitive thing. If you know, it's pretty hard to design yeah. 
fast 3D levels that allow you to still have the good reaction. I feel times. like uh, with the technology they had at the time, they did a good job with the adventure series. Yeah, I will. It, I will admit that it has not aged as well as it could have, but I don't think it's as bad as people like fucking Ego Raptor would have you believe. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's just bad at the game. Yeah, that's okay. We're not. Not not here to take pop shots, but you know. He has a tendency to label games as being bad when he's just bad at them. Yeah, we've seen that. Oh well. <laughs> no shit off our back. Yeah, ain't no ain't no flies off me. Yeah, don't don't put any shit on my back. That's kinda of gross. No, I don't know why he would do that. Like what would the practical application of that be? I don't know. It's like there's Fuck definitely it. far more efficient ways to fertilize large fields than that i mean like i can't even think of it i'm trying to grow this nice turf on my on my hindquarters here yeah unless you're trying to become like the human version of torterra like i can't see the reason for it (laughs) all right on that note on that shitty note quite literally um i was wondering when you were gonna break out your first bad pun on the podcast yeah there broke, it is. I broke mm. all your virgin waters puns. I don't know. Where. Virgin waters. <laughs> virgin waters would be a nice name for a company. I believe. I'm. I'm sure. Like a the virgin. The, I'm sure the virgin company owns like a water treatment. Or in the Virgin Islands, there's some boating something. company called Virgin Waters. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So we were trying to end the podcast, and then we got sidetracked. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for listening. Uh. This is kind of a rambly episode, but I think it turned out okay. Yeah. Considering how little we went in with. Um, we're available on iTunes and Stitcher and TuneIn and other podcast things that let you subscribe to an RSS feed. And uh, you can email us at SaturnStuds at Outlook.com and follow us on Twitter at Studs Saturn or something like that. Um, it's in the YouTube description. Uh, this will hit the other platforms before we'll hit YouTube but uh, yeah they're still worth checking out on YouTube because mm-hmm. reasons so until then platform like Nights into Dreams not Superman 64 <laughs> god damn yes <laughs> should have mentioned that game I'm just going to have to end because it yeah. will evoke my ire thank you for listening just think about it <laughs> don't think about it I'll give you nightmares <laughs> Nights into Dreams will save those yes okay Bye. Bye. <laughs>